I've been preaching now for off and on, until uh, I became a full-time preacher, 44 years. And I still remember the very first sermon I ever preached. It was on the second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming of Christ is, in fact, it is called, uh, in Titus chapter 213, the blessed hope. Almost every generation has received the words of Christ with great joy when he said in John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 3, or at least in verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. We've been looking forward to the coming of Christ, and we believe that we are in the generation that will see the fulfillment of this great prophecy. But may I remind you that Ellen White thought the same thing. Uriah Smith thought the same thing. A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, later Wilcox, Watson, and others thought the same thing. Now the expression, interestingly, the expression last days, as at least you read it in the King James Bible, the expression last days is used eight different times. Last days, plural, is used eight times, and time of the end is used five times. And similar expressions are found throughout the Bible. So how should we understand them? So let's first notice some of the statements of the apostles that would seem to indicate that the coming of the Lord was very near, perhaps even imminent in their day. For example, if you had witnessed the events on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out after the resurrection of Jesus. And if you had heard Peter preach, you might have believed that the end of all things was at hand. There in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, we read, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass when, what does the text say? In the last days, saith God. Not my idea, not Peter's idea, saith God. He's quoting here from Joel. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. If you had been one of those uh, early Christians who had gotten some of the epistles of Paul, you might have read something like in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, where it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in what? These last days spoken unto us by a son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And then later on in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26. For then must he, referring to Christ, often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once... In the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Paul wrote that 1900 plus years ago, maybe, you know, a long time ago. The end of the world. Paul didn't finish there. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, he says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. Why? The Lord is at hand. And then in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 22, he says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema. And then he finishes by saying what? That famous word, maranatha, which means what? It means our Lord comes or come Lord. And so why Paul continued to write these things, in fact, he wrote uh, about the mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians chapter two and verse three he said let no man deceive you by any means for that day now what day is he talking about when he says that day second. the second coming of jesus the return of christ he says for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition so it seems like paul saying well now just put on the brakes a little bit it can't happen until this son of man is revealed but then in verse seven he says for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Pretty close. Now, when we look at the New Testament, we see Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and so on, right? But remember that the order of the books in the New Testament is not placed chronologically in the order in which they were written. 
Many scholars believe that 1st and 2nd th Thessalonians were probably two of the first books of the New Testament that were penned. And he's writing here in these epistles to the Thessalonians about this mystery of iniquity. It's already working even in our time. Now, possibly the last book that was ever written in the New Testament was 1st John. 1st John. Probably written actually after what we call 2nd and 3rd John today, but it's a little hard to know exactly sure, but we know it's penned probably very near the end of the life of the Apostle John. And in 1st John chapter 2 verse 18, he says, little children, it is the last time. What time is it? It's the last time. And as you've heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. We certainly should know it today, shouldn't we? Now, of course, Jesus did not come within the lifetime of these biblical writers. How should we then understand these verses that seem to place the coming of Christ as being imminent in their day? Certainly many who read or who have read and heard these statements thought that Jesus would come back very soon. For Jesus himself had connected the resurrection of the righteous and the judgment with the last days. In John chapter 39, I'm sorry, John chapter 6 and verses 39 and 40, Jesus said, and this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again when? At the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at what? The last day. The last day. And then verse 44. It says, No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So how do we put these things together and, and add in almost two millennia of time to them? Well, I believe that if we will take this fundamental basic understanding, we will make sense. Biblically, the term last days refers to a period in which the final events of the world are to transpire. The apostles, however, did not say how long this period or dispensation would be. Again, history shut it to be almost 2,000 years, but I think that we understand biblically that the concept of whatever we want to call last days is a period of time that occurs from the time of the cross until the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we might think, well, that's a long time, that's 2,000 years, but friends, a, 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 a thousand years is just a day with the Lord. It's just a, a wink of time in the comparison of all eternity. But what guarantee do we have? What guarantee do we have today that we are now living in the last days? How do we know that we will be buried like Ellen White? That we might not succumb to COVID or something like the consumption that took Jay and Andrews out? How do we know that we are living in the last days? You know, well, I, there's wars and rumors of wars, and yeah, there's been all those things for the last 2,000 years too, right? What guarantee do we have that this will not go on? Now, in Matthew chapter 24, we know that chapter is famous, it's well known among most biblical students because this chapter, Jesus describes many of the signs of his coming and the end of the world, right? Jesus connected the signs of his coming and the end of the world. He said that there would be wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. And again, we've seen these for many years, we can say certainly we have seen them multiply in these last days. But I suppose the people in the generation before us thought they saw them multiplied beyond what they had been before. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelation shed further light upon this picture. If you use the King James Version of the Bible, or what sometimes it's termed the authorized version, we find the phrase, time of the end, five times in the book of Daniel. I'll just give you those references if you'd like to take them down. It's Daniel 8, 17, 11, 35, 11, 40, 12, 4, and 12, 9. The phrase, time of the end. Adventists 
have historically, and I believe correctly, interpreted this as a specific period of time which began at the end of the 1260 year prophecy. And that was a prophetic time period that's mentioned both in Daniel and Revelation in various ways. You have time, times, dividing at times, time, time, half a time, 42 months, 1,203 score days, and so on. This time prophecy is understood to have begun in AD 538 and finished in AD 1798. And I think that we're all familiar with those historical dates. We're familiar with the, the events, and so I won't take time, uh, which is pretty dear right now, to, to go through those, those points. But I want to share just some historical points from our pioneers on how they viewed that, those prophecies, if I could. And this first one is from Jane Andrews. Uh, you know, Jane Andrews was our first missionary that we sent out. Why did we send Jane Andrews? Does anyone know? Why did they decide to send Jane Andrews? Because he was the best. Because they said he was the best man we had. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you something. There's a, there's a university named after him today, and there's not a single teacher there that could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jane Andrews in the Bible. Mm. Mm. But you know, if you believed what Jane Andrews believed, you wouldn't even be allowed to attend that university today. Did you know that? That's true. He wrote this in the three angels, or the messages of Revelation, the three messages of Revelation, on page 19. He said, and what is of very deep interest, the point of time at which Paul's warning expires is the commencement of the time of the end. The very point to which the visions of Daniel were closed up and sealed. Compare Daniel 11, 35, 33, 35, 725, and the fact that the 1260 years persecution of the saints terminates with the commencement of the time of the end will appear obvious. So he speaks about this thing called the time of the end, and then there's the end of time, you see. The end of time, biblically, is this big, long period, but now we have the time of the end, this little subsection, if you please, of it. Uh, Lockborough in Heavenly Visions, page 23. Make sure I have the right slide up. It says, according to Daniel 11.35, the time of the end is when that power is overthrown, which had been persecuting the people of God, that power whose time was appointed, in 1798, the civil authority was taken from that power which had been, for the 1260 years, the time appointed persecuting the people of God. This marks 1798 as the time of the end. The time of the end. So it sounds a lot alike, doesn't it? It's a very similar phraseology. The end of time, time of the end. But the end of time, the last days, is again that large portion of time from the time of the cru crucifixion, time of the cross, to Jesus comes. But now we have this expression, the time of the end, which is a like a little block at the very end of that whole period. And, and I could read you some more statements. Here's one from Uriah Smith from the Biblical Institutes of page 54 and 55. I've got a reference here from uh, James White from Bible Adventism, page 70, and I won't take time to read those for you. But we'll make these notes available uh, for the folks online. For anyone who'd like to have them here later, you can, you can have these references for you. But just prior to 1798, and again, I'm just reviewing at this point some history that we as Adventists know. But just prior to 1798, and very soon thereafter, there were special signs in the earth and heavens, and these were recognized as fulfillments of biblical prophecy. There was the Lisbon earthquake of November 1, 1755. There was the great dark day of May 19. Uh, 1780, when the day became dark and the night to the moon became as blood, and then on November 13th of 1833, the Leonard meteor shower occurred with over 60,000 meteorites an hour being visible. Mm -hmm. Many students of Bible prophecy understood these events as fulfillment of Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, where we read, And behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. And I don't know if you've ever been around fig trees or not before, but like most fruit trees, uh, if, if everything's calm, when the, ripe, the fruit is ripe, it just drops, it drops straight down. But if the fruit is not ripe, it doesn't drop yet unless it's almost ripe. And then it can drop if it's shaken. 
And when you shake the tree, it, it doesn't fall straight. It falls in different directions. And this was the way the meteorite shower was of that year. And, and biblical students connected that. These were signs. These were signs that the coming judgment prophesied in Daniel 8, 14. And I believe about that prophecy with all my heart. I believe it as sure as I'm sitting here or standing here today. And, and friends, you better believe it too. Because it's sure. But they began to understand that this, these were signs that were pointing us to the fulfillment of Daniel 8, 14. And as the Advent people continued to study, they realized that something that they would later call the investigative judgment began on October 22 of 1844. And there should be at least one amen for that. Amen. For a generation, these people believed that Jesus would come soon, even in their lifetimes. Notice what Ellen White wrote, for instance, in 1872, 20, about 28 years after 1844. Because time is what? Short. We should work with diligence and double energy. Our children, our children, the children, the parents of children in 1872, our children may never enter college. So even if they're infants, we may not even have 18 years left, she said, right? 1872. Ellen White's writings not only spoke of the soon coming of Jesus, but sadly also explained later that there might be a delay. For example, in 1868, she said, the long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy, because if the master should come, so many would be found unready. In Manuscript 4 of 1883, you can find it's published in Evangelism, page 696.2. It's also in seven letters in manuscripts, I believe. I don't have the page number handy, but you can look it up. But she says here, and this again is in 1883. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly kingdom. Let me just pause for a minute. Who's modern in Israel supposed to be? We are. And in 1883, who would have you called modern Israel? The Seventh-day Adventist people, right? Okay. So she says, these same sins that kept ancient Israel out of the uh, earthly kingdom are keeping modern Israel out of the heavenly king, king, kingdom in Canaan. She says, in neither case were the promises of God at fault, it is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. And friends, if you want to examine yourself, you know, Paul says, let every man examine himself, right? And sisters too. Right there's a good place to start. Right there's a good place to start. Before you start worrying about someone else, worry about yourself. Because of a lack of faith, which led to disobedience, of course. God could not take the children of Israel to the promised land. When Jonah preached that in 40 days Nineveh would be overthrown, it didn't happen. Why? Because the people of God repented at the message. And Ellen White, well understanding the principles that men's actions can at times alter God's purposes. She later wrote this, and this is to a letter uh, written to P.T. McGann, Percy T. McGann, Dr. McGann. And the, the date is so infamous, December 7, 1901, exactly 40 years before Pearl Harbor. She said this, we may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years, as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. And you can find that in the Spalding McGann collection 202.4, and also I think it's in letters and manuscripts. But she said, in 1901, we may, we may have to be here. A few more years? No, she said, many more years. Many more years. And so today, we are here now, it is November, uh, 2021. It is 177 years past 1844. Almost 188 years since the falling of the stars. 
120 years almost since this letter was written. And we still anxiously wait. But friends, these prophetic events can no longer be considered to many people as being significant. 1844, the falling of the stars, the dark day, the Lisbon earthquake. People look at that and they say, you know, that's a long time ago. A couple hundred years or more. Getting near 300 years to the Lisbon earthquake. Why, why isn't it going to continue for another couple hundred years? You know, I'm, I'm going to plan to put my, my grandkids through college and, and, you know, leave a big inheritance because they're going to need it. They're going to be around for a while. That's what people think. So how can we dare think, based upon some of these points, that we could possibly be the last generation? Beloved, surely we are living in the end of time, even if that exact phrase is not found in the Bible. But what is our real evidence to believe this? Certain events in the world point to the coming of Christ, but scoffers have said these events have come and gone for centuries. You know, the, 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 the Pope and, and, and some of his cohorts are talking about these Green New Deals, and this is going to be the way Sunday comes in. And, and, and in fact, it may be used to help as an entering wedge. But I want to tell you this. We've been told that the issues of the mark of the beast are going to be clear to everyone. This thing cannot end up finishing. It may, it may start, if you please. It may start in a covert way, but it's not going to finish that way. People are going to know what the real issues are. The issue is not going to be climate change in the end of time. The issue is going to be the commandments of God versus the commandments of men, and people are going to be able to make intelligent decisions. I would like to propose to you that Jesus indeed himself gave a prophecy whose fulfillment we see today, which pinpoints exactly the time that we are living as the final generation. Now, I mentioned earlier that Matthew chapter 24 is a, a, a chapter that deals with the prophecies of the soon coming Christ, soon, and the end of the world. And if you're a little familiar with the harmonies of the Bible, or the, especially the harmonies of the gospel, rather, uh, you know that the parallel chapter for Matthew 24 in Mark is 13, and in Luke it's chapter 21. There is no parallel in the book of John for it, okay? But you have Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Can you say that with me again? Let's remember those. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Thank you very much. Now I want to direct your attention, and I am so thankful. Brother Robert was speaking, I think, last night about the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus. I'm so thankful for it, brothers and sisters. You probably have heard Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. Well, he got a lot of letters from Ellen White. But there's a letter you probably have never heard of before. And uh, this was letter 20 of 1901, written to Dr. Kellogg. You can find this in Councils to Writers and Editors. And I believe I have the page there. It's 23.3. Is that right? 233. Uh, that's wrong. It's 23.3. I didn't get the decimal point in there, so I will correct that. Thank you. It's, it actually begins on page 23 and carries over to 24, but, but she says this. Now listen carefully. There's a couple key components you don't want to miss. In the 21st chapter of Luke, Christ foretold what was to come upon Jerusalem, and with it he connected the scenes which were to take place in the history of the world just prior to to the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, Ellen White here, she noted Luke chapter 21. She didn't say Matthew chapter 24. She didn't refer to Mark chapter 13. And she mentions events that she says that were to come upon Jerusalem, which were to take place in the history of this world just prior to the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, friends, there must be a reason that Ellen White specifically mentioned Luke chapter 21. And why did she specifically mention Jerusalem? Now, just think about Jerusalem for a minute. Clearly, the city of Jerusalem, which lies in Palestine, is not God's chosen city today. I think we all understand that. It's not his chosen city today, but neither was it his chosen city in AD 66 or in AD 70. Now, do we know of any 
days. Uh, I, I, maybe I want to say prophetic dates, and they are in a sense. Uh, they, they tell about prophetic events. They're dates of prophetic events. Let me put it that way. That we connect with the city of Jerusalem that deal with AD 66 and AD 70. Remember, in, in, in Jesus said you'd see the city surrounded and then you flee. But you know how do you how do you flee when the city surrounded? You know. But we know that historically, in 66. The, the, the Roman uh, general Cestus came, Cestus Gallus, he came and he surrounded the city. But then he seemingly mysteriously withdrew. And at that time, the Christians who were in Jerusalem remembered the, the, the teaching of Jesus and they said, we got to get out of here. And they went over to the area called Perea. They settled in Perea. And yet there was a wall now of almost three and a half years Probably a lot of them thought, you know, maybe we should go back. But Jesus said, don't go back. And when Titus came, when Titus came, he sieged the city and thousands of Jews lost their life. But there wasn't a single Christian who died. You know why? Because they all got out. They listened to the words of Jesus and they got out. Now, I've been to Rome. And in Rome... There's something called the Arch of Titus, or Tito, as they would call it. And I don't know if you've ever seen in your history books a picture of the Arch of Titus. But I've stood right under it. I've been right on it. I've touched it. I've photographed it. And I should have brought you some of the pictures tonight. But I didn't. Sorry. However, that arch is for one thing. That arch is to commemorate the destruction of Jerusalem. That's what it's there for. And they actually have engraved on it. The destruction of Jerusalem, and, and there are engravings of the soldiers carrying out the candelabra from the from the holy place, and and the sacred furniture. Now, those events happened to Jerusalem, and Jesus spoke of Jerusalem as being surrounded, right? But it wasn't God's chosen city. Are we agreed? We got that. Keep that in mind. But these events connected with Jerusalem during the time of the apostles were to be signs for the early Christians. And I want to tell you that events that are connected with Jerusalem today are to be signs for God's people today. It doesn't make Jerusalem God's chosen city today. But Jesus is using Jerusalem to speak to us. So let's examine Luke chapter 21 and let's see what Jesus has to say about Jerusalem and what Ellen White also has to say about what will take place just before Jesus comes. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 20, and the parallel of Mark is chapter 13, verses 14 through 19, there Jesus speaks about an abomination of desolation and of the need of the Christians to flee the city of Jerusalem. And we, we made reference to that earlier. But in similar fashion, Luke speaks about the city being surrounded and Christians fleeing in Luke chapter 21, verses 20 and 21. And there's one portion of this prophecy that neither Matthew nor Mark address or mention. It's in the last part in verse 24. But let's read those few verses just to get the context in Luke chapter 21. Starting in verse 20, it says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compass with armies, then know that the destruction thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of, of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And then he continued and says, But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon the people. And friends, we, we, we read those things in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13. Maybe slightly different worded, but, but the, those things we find there. But what don't we find there? The very next verse. And it says, and, th and they shall be, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jesus said that Jerusalem would be trodden down of Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So, what does this mean? Is this possibly speaking of literal Jerusalem, or is it possibly symbolic? I would like to refer you 
to William Miller's 11th rule of interpretation. Remember William Miller and his rules of interpretation? We maybe read and heard about them, I'm sure. But he said this in Rules of Interpretation, page 22. How to know when a word is used figuratively. If it makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, then it must be understood literally, if not figuratively. It's like we read about the, the beast of Daniel 7, a lion with eagle's wings. We know that there is no literal lion that has eagle's wings, right? We know there's no four-headed leopard with four wings of a fowl. And so we understand those things have to be symbolic. But when we read about simple things that, that clearly could stand as literal, they should be understood as such, Miller said. And Ellen White says the same thing in the book Great Controversy on page 598 in paragraph 3. There we read this. The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning unless a symbol or figure is employed. Christ has given the promise, if any man will do his will, he should know the doctrine, John 7, 17. So, friends, I believe based upon the text, based upon the context of the text, there's no reason to believe that the Jerusalem mentioned in Luke 21, 24 should be considered in any other way than to be the literal city of Jerusalem. We can easily accept that the portions of the prophecy which deal with the surrounding of the city by the army to be literal, and whilst we've noted Jerusalem was no longer God's chosen city, it could still function as a sign to God's people. And there's no reason to believe that verse 24 alone should be figurative or symbolic. Some have attempted to make it a symbol of the church or of God's people in this prophecy, but the context would have to be ignored totally to come up with such an interpretation. Jesus said that the city of Jerusalem, now he's not speaking about the nation of Israel, not speaking about a third temple being rebuilt, speaking about the city of Jerusalem, would be trodden down, trampled down, or crushed under the feet of the Gentiles until the time for the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, the, the, the Greek word that we translate Gentiles is ethnos, ethnos, uh, which we get our word ethnic from. And this word is used um, several times, and this graphic ring just shows you in proportion how it is translated in the Bible. You see it's actually translated Gentiles just a, a little more than 50% of the time, but it's also to a great degree translated as nation or nations. Nations or nations. Uh, it's even translated as heathen or the people. And uh, ethnos was synonymous with anyone who was not a Jew. You know, we live in today in, in, in a culture, and you know, if you're woke enough, I guess I, maybe I, I'm very, very careful here, but if you're woke enough, you know, you gotta understand that there is a multitude of people, and we all just fit in together. Now, I'd like to say I think that's a bunch of baloney. Fundamentally, friends, there is one race, and it's the human race. There's one race, it's the human race, and that's the race that's important, amen? amen. But to the Jewish mind, there was two groups of people in this world. There was the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews and everyone else. And that's why this word ethnos is accurately and rightfully at times translated nations. Nations as well. Here's an illustration of Paul using this word in uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 29. It says, is he, the, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles, or ethnon from, this is a generative form of ethnos. Yes, of the Gentiles also. And that's, again, ethnon for, from ethnos. And, and you can see this in other places. But he's saying, basically, you've got these two groups here. You've got the Jews, but he's the God of the Jews, but he's the God of everyone else, too. Okay? Keep that in mind. So Jesus says in Luke chapter 21, verse 24, that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, or the nations, the non-Jewish people. That's what that word ultimately means. It comes down to being the non-Jewish people. He says they would be trodden down. Now this word trodden down in the Greek means to harm severely by subjugation, or to conquer and to keep under subjection. So when he says they'd be trodden down, he says that they would be put into subjection. 
and in control. And so he says that they would be in the control, Jerusalem would be in the control of non-Jewish hands until the times of the nations, or the times of the Gentiles was over. Now the concept of what Jesus meant by the times of the Gentiles or nations, I, I hope to discuss tomorrow on Sunday. But the point I want to make is, right today, that, um, that Jerusalem was to be a sign for the last day Christians that the times of the nations was done, and the end is indeed imminent. Now history clearly documents a lot about the, 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 the city of Jerusalem, and I suppose there's more history on the city of Jerusalem than probably any other city in the world. But from a biblical standpoint, from, from prof prophetic standpoints, we know that there are some points of time in the past that were important. For instance, we mentioned 66 and 70, right? AD 66, AD 70. And Ellen White spoke about some of this history in the book Great Controversy. And this is from page 30, paragraph 2. And it's a long paragraph. I've broken it in four slides so you can see the text a little better. But we have time. I think we have time, and we'll just read this quickly here. It says, after the Romans under Cestus had surrounded the city, they unexpectedly abandoned the siege when everything seemed favorable for an imminent attack. The besieged, despairing of successful resistance, were on the point of surrender when the Roman general withdrew his forces without the least apparent reason. But God's merciful providence was directing events for the good of his own people. She continues. The promised sign had been given to the waiting Christians, and now an opportunity was offered for all who would to obey the Savior's warning. Events were so overruled that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the flight of the Christians. Upon the retreat of Cestus, the Jews, sailing from Jerusalem, poured after his retiring army, and while both forces were thus fully engaged, the Christians had an opportunity to leave the city. At this time, the country also had been cleared of enemies who might have endeavored to intercept them. And then she finishes by saying this. At the time of the siege, the Jews were assembled at Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, and thus the Christians throughout the land were able to make their escape unmolested. Without delay, they fled to a place of safety, the city of Pella in the land of Perea, beyond Jordan. So that's, those are historical events that are confirmed by inspiration to us. Now, we know that in the year AD 70, Titus again came to Jerusalem, and he brought the foretold destruction to the city. From that time until AD 638, Jerusalem was controlled by the Roman and the Byzantine powers. Control then passed first to the Arabs and then to the Crusaders until the 14th century when control of Jerusalem was passed to some of the Egyptian uh, Mamluks. In 1517, Jerusalem was taken over by the Ottoman Empire. After World War I, the control of Jerusalem passed to the British Empire until the State of Israel was formed in 1948. At that time, in 1948, the city was divided into two parts. The newer part of the city on the west was in the hands of the Jews, while the old city, the original city, was controlled by the Islamic country of Jordan. This was not a fulfillment of the prophecy of Luke, but we are told in Desire of Ages, on page 630. Six, that coming events cast their shadows before. This was the status of Jerusalem until 1967. And if you think about all those different groups or powers that were in control of Jerusalem from the time of Titus until 1967, they were all non-Jewish people. But this changed during the Six-Day War the old city of Jerusalem was captured and finally returned to Jewish hands. You remember that the Egyptian army invaded Israel? And King Hussein, some of you may remember King Hussein of Jordan, he actually got on the phone and, 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 and talked to the Israelis. He said, if, if you stay out of this, we'll have nothing to do with you. You know, don't, don't bother us. We won't bother you. Because, and that was significant because he had signed a, 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 a pact with Nasser. The, the president of Egypt, that if he went to war, he would go, excuse me, he would go to war with him. He says, well, well, we'll stay out of this if you leave us alone. But no, because of this pact, the Israelis attacked Jordan with lightning force. And the first thing they did was to recapture the old city of Jerusalem. And thus, 
we see the beginning of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus as recorded in Luke 21, 24. Cementing their hold on the city of Jerusalem. And by the way, this date is so important. July the 30th of 1980. July the 30th of 1980. The Jewish Knesset, which is the parliament of the Israeli government, they proclaimed Jerusalem the official capital of Israel. Now, the reason I say that that date is important is if you will compare that date to the date that the General Conference in 1980 voted the fundamental statement of belief that included the abomination of the Trinity, you'll find it's very interesting that the church acted and God responded. The church acted and God responded. Even very recently, on December the 6th of 2017, United States President Donald Trump at that time announced the United States' recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The new U.S. Embassy was officially opened in Jerusalem on May 14, 2018, coinciding with the 70th anniversary of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. Now you might think, well, what does that mean? I'm going to tell you, it means a lot more than you might think. If you get a map today, you probably could go to the store and buy a map today. And if you look at it, and look at Israel, it probably will have Tel Aviv marked as the capital. Did you know that? Tel Aviv used to be the capital of Israel. And yet today, only America, and I think one or two other countries, actually recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Because it's just so impolitically correct to do that otherwise. But it's just like, if, if you know, our... our the United States of America, our, our capital was first where? Where was our first capital? <laughs> Let's try Philadelphia. Let's just try Philadelphia. Okay, so our government didn't always reside in what we today call the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., right? Okay, but, but we know where our capital is. But what if I got a Russian textbook, and the Russian textbook said the capital of the United States today is Philadelphia? I said, well, that's wrong, right? And, and I would have good reason to say it's wrong because I'm an American. I know what the, the city of our capital is. I know where it is. I've been there. You've been there too, probably. In other words, someone else doesn't have the right to dictate to the United States who or where our capital is, right? And no one has the right to tell the Israelis what or where their capital is. Only they can do that. And they say it's Jerusalem today. They say it's Jerusalem today. Now here's a chart, it may be a little hard to see because it's a little small, it's sort of strung out, but it's just going back through some of those dates and a few other dates. In, you have in AD 31, Jesus gives the prophecy of Jerusalem. In 66, you have Sistus laying siege and then was withdrawing. In AD 70, you have uh, Titus overrunning the city. And from then until 1967, you have Jerusalem under the control of the Gentiles. In 1948, you have the nation of Israel formed. And that of itself was not prophetically significant, except that, as we're told, coming events cast their shadows before. In 67, AD 67, you had the Six-Day War from June 5 through uh, 10, and Jerusalem finally comes under control. In 1980, they moved the capital to tell, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And, um, and then in 2018, we had the opening of the embassy in, uh, in Jerusalem, and our recognition the year before. By, by President Trump. So the only thing left on this timeline is the second coming of Christ. Now for almost 1900 years, the city of Jerusalem was held by the Gentiles. As Jesus very concluding, I say concluding his discourse in Luke chapter 21 and verse 32, he said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass until all be fulfilled. Well, what generation? You see, because there were generations who saw some of those prior signs, but everything didn't get fulfilled. Jesus didn't come, right? You know, there were people like Ellen White and Joseph Bates who saw some of those great signs that we read about, and yet it didn't come. And so I have to understand that when Jesus said that when we see these signs, it's going to be the generation that sees the last of the signs. The generation that sees those last of those signs is indeed the final generation. And the last sign being the prophecy of Jerusalem. The generation that saw this sign that's living during this time is indeed the last generation. Now I might be asked, and I quickly will try to uh, respond to this question, is this time setting? 
is this time setting. And no, it clearly is not time setting. Time setting would involve, listen carefully, time setting has to involve a specific future date based upon a Bible prophecy when a specific event occurs. This is not the case in the times of the Gentiles. Students of biblical prophecy look back at events like 1755, 1780, 1833. We look back at those dates as fulfillment of prophecies. But there were no dates set before those prophecies. There was no prophecy saying it would happen at this time. But we look back at the fulfilled time and we know it happened, right? It's just like with the Sunday Law. There is no prophetic time telling us when the Sunday Law is going to happen, right? But we know it's going to happen. We, we believe it's going to happen very soon. And there will be a day it does happen. And when it does happen, the day after, the week after, the month after, or whatever, we're going to be able to look back and say, on this day, this happened. But that's not time setting. It's just simply recognizing when a prophecy was fulfilled. Perhaps you've believed for many years that Jesus Christ's second coming is soon. It's very soon to occur. Perhaps you've known others who have believed the same thing but have died in the faith of the three angels' messages. But beloved, I want to assure you, even if I, uh, if I get hit by a Mack truck crossing the road to the motel after this meeting, this is still the final generation. And if one of us here today contracts COVID, which I do believe is a real disease, I, I'm, I have a lot of questions about where it came from and all those other things, but listen, there are people who are dying this is not just a total faith. There are people who are dying. People who have never been vaccinated, as well as people who have been vaccinated, are dying. I have a daughter who's a, a, a flight paramedic, and, and she is, she's seen a lot of people die, friends. And I don't think she's storing, giving me, me tall tales either. If I get COVID and die tonight or next week, this is still the final generation. I want to assure you, friends, we are living in the time of the end. Jesus is coming in this generation, and we must be ready for these momentous Amen. events. Now, what is the significance of this times of the Gentiles, and, and how do we relate to that? And, and I think that this has a very, very special bearing for us at this time, and I want to share that starting tomorrow and Sunday. So I'd like to take time, since we did finish on time, to have prayer now. And then, and then we'll have a song after the prayer. Our Father in heaven. We thank you so much that, that there are some of us, Father, who are just tired. We, we may be getting older. We may have infirmities about us, and, and we've been in this movement for a long time, and we want to go home. We want things to end. We want them to end soon. And, and Father, this, this prophecy of Jesus that Ellen White points us to, I believe it gives us hope and assurance that, that this, this long night of struggle is about over. And Jesus is going to come soon. And help us to understand better our place and purpose at this time. And to know just how we can live to serve you and to serve others. We thank you for these meetings. We ask your continued blessing upon us. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.